Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for this talk on adult capacity and decision making this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in the Mi'kmaqwagi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. My name is Ruth Strubank, and I'm the executive director at the Nova Scotia Association for Community Living. Uh, the NSACL is a provincial nonprofit committed to ensuring that individuals with intellectual disabilities and their families have the supports required to live full and inclusive community, life in community. NSACL will be celebrating its 64th year this year, and I think what's most important to note is that it began in Halifax with a group of families who came together that decided that they wanted their sons and daughters to have, it began with inclusive education long time ago, so there you go, a little bit of history. We're a part of the Canadian Association, we're part of the Federation across the country. All provinces and territories have associations for community living, and in a little while we'll hear from Anna McQuarrie from Inclusion International, the mothership. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so tonight we'll hear from the three panelists, and we'll talk about adult capacity and decision making, and this is an important issue in the disability rights community. But frankly, this is an important issue for all Nova Scotians and all Canadians. This law impacts every single person in this room, potentially at some point in their life. We believe that a person, regardless of label or perceived capacity, should have the right to exercise control over their own person. Think of a time in your own life when the right to make a decision was removed. How did that feel? Do you want anyone to take over making all your decisions? I suppose maybe some days that answer would be yes, but probably not always. We all aspire to have control over our lives. People can have power when they are valued and respected. How support is provided is the issue. We must enable people to have power rather than taking power away. Power on and power with. That's what we want to see. So let me just share a couple of things around what, uh, what does the right to legal capacity mean. Community living is fully realized only when people have power over their decisions. Access to supports may be required to exercise legal capacity, and access to supports is referred to as supported decision making. Government and all people have a role to play. This past December, I had the opportunity to attend the eighth annual policy forum, Inclusion, Realization of the Right to Capacity for Persons with Intellectual Disabilities that was facilitated by the Canadian Association for Community Living and their partners, People First Canada. And the opening remarks from the president of People First Canada, Corey Earl, still stand out in my mind. And I just wanted to share a couple of things that he spoke with first voice around this very issue. So what Corey began his conversation was about what, what it means to him. And he said, when people make decisions for others, it means we get placed to live someplace we don't want to live. It means we get a poor education. We cannot spend our money the way we want. We are told where to work, who to play with, and where to play. We have no control over our lives and many people get stuck there. There's um, just a couple of other things that I want to mention just about what's happening across the country in Canada because we'll get a little more context for Nova Scotia in just a minute. There are an estimated 880,000 to 1 million Canadians with disabilities who have someone who help them make decisions daily. The more severe that a person's disability is, the more likely it is that, that one has someone to help him or her make all those decisions every day. Canadians with cognitive disabilities are more likely than Canadians with physical and or sensory disabilities to have someone help them make daily decisions. People who make decisions with legally recognized supports have reported much success and empowerment. Knowledge about supported decision making is critical. The lack of knowledge of course results in less use. No significant evidence of abuse in relation to supported decision-making practices exist in Canada. Safeguards are critical 
for there to be confidence in support of decision making. As Canadians and as Nova Scotians in particular, we don't equally share the same rights to make decisions in our lives. The current law in Nova Scotia does not represent the full range of supports and possibilities. All right, so let me introduce the panelists. To my right, Archie Kaiser. Archie is at, at Dalhousie. Archie is a professor at the Schulich School, uh, School of Law with a cross appointment to the Department of Psychiatry. In the Department of Psychiatry, he represents legal issues in psychiatry in the residency training program. He teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and mental disability law, civil and criminal. He has been a director of several organizations, including the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Division, the Healthy Minds Co-op, and Reachability, and was a member of the Mental Health and the Law Advisory Committee of the Mental Health Commission of Canada. He is currently a provincial advisor to People First Nova Scotia. Sitting on Archie's right is Anne McQuarrie. Anne is Inclusion International's Director of Global Advocacy and Human Rights. She has a master's degree in human rights from the University of Essex. Her focus is supporting the realization of the rights and full inclusion of persons with intellectual disabilities and their families around the world. Anna worked actively on the development of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and continues to work with its members, other disability organizations and government partners on making the CRPD real and meaningful for people with disabilities and their families. And then Sheila Wildman on the end. Sheila is an associate professor here at the Schulich School of Law where she teaches administrative law, public law and jurisprudence. She has written book chapters and articles on legal capacity in Canadian law and under the CRPD. In this and other work of subjects such as consent to psychiatric treatment and public adult protection, Sheila's central research question is, what role law or litigation may play in challenging coercive state responses to disability and promoting human rights to autonomy and community inclusion in a context of respect for diversity. Please join me in welcoming the three panelists. Thank you, Ruth, for your uh, generous introduction of us all. Um, it's my job tonight to uh, provide you with some historical context uh, for uh, the later discussion, which I'll also uh, provide you with on the new law in Nova Scotia. Um, and then as the uh, irresponsible male law professor, I'll sit down and the two women on stage will clean up the mess that I've left. Seems normal, doesn't it? So, I do want to talk then first about uh, the past that the Supreme Court of Canada has uh, emphasized uh, that we have to live with in our country. That persons with a mental disability have been systematically isolated, segregated from the mainstream of society, devalued, ridiculed, and excluded from participation in ordinary social and political processes. The history of people with disabilities in Canada is largely one of exclusion, and marginalization, and we're talking here, as the court has recognized, about exclusion from the labor force, um, opportunities for social interaction and advancement, and people also being subject to invidious stereotyping and relegation to institutions. To bring it home to us, and to remind us of our sad roots here, um, I have a few slides here of where adults with alleged decisional impairments have had to live. Um, the poorhouse here uh, at the top left uh, was at the corner of Roby and South, just down the street from us, hundreds of feet away. 31 people died in 1882 in a fire there because obviously you know, it wasn't properly safeguarded for persons with disabilities. It was replaced with the poorhouse that uh, emerged on University Avenue that was only demolished in 1972. Uh, this is uh, the remains of the Halifax County Home and Mental Hospital, as it was called, later called the Halifax County Rehabilit Regional Rehabilitation Center. It existed from 1887 to 2002, uh, where people lived in a congregate setting, uh, forced into institutional living. And finally, you know, there's a more contemporary uh, um, institution called Quest, a Society for Adult uh, Support and Rehabilitation, of which more of it later. 
But I do want to also to draw your attention to a case that's currently being litigated before the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, uh, where uh, persons with intellectual disabilities have been kept in this facility, Emerald Hall in the Nova Scotia Hospital, far longer than their medical and social needs uh, ought to have dictated. Beth McLean uh, is one of the complainants, but there are others who allege the simple truth that they should be permitted to live in small homes in the community with assistance. So that's what we've had in terms of local institutional history. But I want to talk also about our history of legislation because the law has not been um, the protective and empowering institution that it ought to have been for persons with disabilities. Indeed, the history of guardianship law for persons who are allegedly incapable of making decisions has very ancient roots, going back to 449 BC in, in BC, permitting control over people by their families. And in England, as from the 13th century, the crown assumed control over persons who were referred to as idiots and lunatics. And that terminology we've had in Nova Scotia until relatively recently. There a gradual melding of legal controls over persons deemed idiots and insane over the years. We inherited these prejudices in Nova Scotia in our legislative framework. The Lunacy Act, and here I'm quoting for the 1923 version, provided for the appointment of a guardian over a person who is incapable of taking care of himself with the guardian having the care and custody of such insane person and in the management of his or her estate, where the guardian had full uncontrolled authority over the individual's daily life and liberty and their finances. This was derived you know, from the English Lunacy and Lunatics Act and the County Asylums Act. The Incompetent Persons Act, which is what we've just gotten rid of here in Nova Scotia, here I quote from the 1989 version, continued this interventionist and coercive tradition. Uh, it provided for the appointment of guardians over insane persons who are incapable from infirmity of mind of managing their own affairs with full powers over that insane person, just as they were under the English Lunacy Act, permitting the guardian to control everything. The Incompetent Persons Act also provided for the apprehension of any lunatic at large, uh, the committal of insane persons and dangerous idiots to the asylum for the harmless insane, and the taking of insane persons or dangerous idiots under the care and protection of any relative, guardian, or friend. Even this terminology under the old act was not changed until 2007. What was wrong with this statute? Well, it's pretty clear for most of us, beyond the stigmatizing labels, uh, that the Nova Scotia Law Reform Commission was absolutely right in 1995 when they said it contained offensive and stigmatizing language. It imposed no limits on guardianship orders. There was an overemphasis uh, on property, and it provided for no monitoring over guardians. There was too much paternalism, according to the Nova Scotia Law Reform Commission. There was the potential for undue interference in decisions about daily living and health care. There were numerous Charter of Rights and Freedoms violations, and they just said, repeal this legislation. What did our government do? Nothing. <laughs> Uh, there were no meaningful changes in the legislation for over 20 years uh, until the case which I'm about to discuss with you now. This man, Landon Webb, um, was responsible for, with his supporters, the demise of the Incompetent Persons Act. He had been subject to an order since he was 19. He was in his late 20s when this case was brought, required to live in rehabilitation centers, even the subject of uh, a police request for helping in looking for him when he left the facility in 2015. These are entries from the Chronicle Herald. And even his local MLA asking for the public to reach out to your local police department to make sure this person was apprehended. Landon said uh, that he was simply entitled to equal treatment. And when he was picked up by the police, he said, they arrested me, put me in the jail for about an hour and a half, handcuffed me like I was a criminal. And he said this simple thing, I never did anything wrong. Uh, Landon's mother took exception even to uh, um, the reporter who interviewed her son for this article that I quote from, saying it was inappropriate because he was incompetent. But Landon said, I have the right to free speech, the right to live where I choose, just like anyone else. 
um, he went to the uh, Quest uh, facility that I mentioned to you before, a contemporary institution, uh, where there were further restrictions on his fundamental freedoms. Um, Justice Moyer from the Nova Scotia Supreme Court granted an order allowing him access to mail, telephone, communications with his lawyer, which had previously been cut off. His parents said uh, that he didn't understand the guardianship order, order and those who uh, were claiming to assist him, including his lawyers, were just complicating matters. So in 2016, uh, the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia had a constitutional challenge uh, for the Incompetent Persons Act um, and the government wisely uh, conceded that the legislation was unconstitutional. Justice Campbell didn't have to do the heavy lifting he would have done had they not made that, conception, but he, uh, that concession, but he did observe that the law went, was overbroad, it went too far that many people with impairments are not incapable of managing their own affairs because competency is not an all or nothing thing. This resulted in the Incompetence Persons Act being declared invalid in 2016 and the government being given a year uh, to prepare new legislation. We now have new law in place, uh, the Adult Capacity and Decision Making Act as of 2017. I'll explain it uh, to you and then the other panelists are going to talk about some of its limitations. At least this legislation, you know, everyone must concede is an improvement over the Incompetent Persons Act. It had to be because the other act you know, was simply uh, inconsistent with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So it has a preamble uh, that is more attuned to contemporary values that talks about the adults' dignity and autonomy and the entitlement to respect, the presumption of capacity, uh, and the entitlement to any intervention being the least restrictive and least intrusive. Unfortunately, it doesn't mention the Charter of Rights and Freedoms directly, nor the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, of which more soon from the other panelists. It does have a purpose of declaration. It recognizes that people may have impairments in capacity, in capacity uh, and it talks about uh, uh, the, the Act having the intention of providing a fair and respectful legal framework, which had been utterly denied to persons with disabilities before. It is said to promote dignity, autonomy, independence, social inclusion, and freedom of decision making. These are all worthwhile principles and important ones. Whether the legislation does it is another thing. Uh, but it is said also to ensure the least restrictive supports and interventions. It has, as modern legislation often does, uh, a code of interpretative principles uh, where the legislation is meant to be seen by anybody who uses it or is subject to it uh, as uh, being law where adults are entitled to make their own decision uh, on everything until incapacity is shown. Uh, it wisely says that risky or bad decisions don't demonstrate incapacity. If they did, how many of us would be deprived of our civil <laughs> rights? It says that uh, persons with disabilities are entitled to communicate by any means uh, that works for them. And it talks about, again, in situations of incapacity, the adult's uh, autonomy being preserved by ensuring the least restrictive and least intrusive intervention. I don't know whether this chart is visible for you. I've tried to you know, just make a simple procedural flow chart. Um, basically what happens in this legislation and what I'll be explaining to you is that there's an application to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. Notice is given to the adult and others. Uh, and the application has to include a capacity assessment and a representation plan. A judge then determines whether there has been proof of incapacity, uh, proof of the necessity of decisions being made for a person with disabilities. Um, and he or she has to consider whether less restrictive measures might work in the circumstances rather than you know, making an application under this legislation and whether the adult is in need of someone uh, to assist him or her in making decisions. And the judge has to consider the wishes of the individual, uh, the uh, assessment report, the plan for the representation of the individual, and the areas of decision-making needs uh, for that individual who's the subject of the application. The representatives uh, who are appointed have to agree to accept the role. To, uh, uh, they have to be suitable persons. 
Um, and if persuaded, the court then is able to make an order with provides lim which provides limited authority. It's different from the former legislation, where uh, a guardianship order involved plenary control over everything you know, for uh, a person who was subject to the legislation under the Incompetent Persons Act. Control over their finances, control over their person. The new idea is that there will be uh, the ability to make decisions on behalf of the person, but only only if it fits within the legislation and by order of the court. So uh, the limited authority that can be given then relates to issues that concern capacity, it has to be necessary, and it has to be least restrictive. There's a range of possible authority, which I'll explain in greater depth, um, which deals with living arrangements, associates, activities, employment, and education. Uh, and there can be further restrictions on the, uh, the uh, adult, but only with the court order. Adults are meant to be kept informed if the judge is persuaded that an order should issue, and there's guidance for representatives on how to make decisions, and there is the possibility of both reviews of existing orders to change them where necessary, and appeals if there's an error in uh, making the order. So, to go quickly then through what's left, um, an application for a representation order then in greater detail goes to the Supreme Court. Um, and there is the necessity of setting out a representation plan. The order would deal, if it's given, with financial matters, obvious enough, but also with the person's well-being. And here, is a, and I think Sheila will develop it, this concept is a critical one that provides rich advocacy potential because it talks about the, the maximization of physical and mental health, personal autonomy, and social inclusion and participation. Any order has to be oriented towards those goals. The applications, as I mentioned, these, and this includes all the section references from the legislation, have to include the assessment and a representation plan that sets out how the representative will manage the adult's well-being uh, and uh, financial matters and give notice and so on. Uh, the orders may be granted upon these things being shown to be uh, the case in the individual's um, application. That there is a lack of capacity, the adult needing to make decisions, less intrusive matters, uh, measures not being effective, and the adult actually needing a representative. The court considers, as I mentioned before in the flow chart, the wishes of that adult the capacity assessment report, the representation plan, and the matters where decisions need to be made. Because there's no point in interviewing, sorry, in intervening in a person's uh, life unless you have a target for it. Otherwise, you're back to the situation of the Incompetent Persons Act. Capacity assessment, uh, and assessments and reports may proceed with consent if the person has the ability to consent to it, or by court order. And the adult, obviously in our society, because there is the right to silence for all of us, you know, has the ability to refuse to participate, although the preparation of reports can continue based upon observational information and collateral information from other sources. The assessment uh, reports are required to be communicated to the adult. He or she is still required to be involved, notwithstanding that the report may conclude that the person is incapable. And the assessors have to consider the likelihood of the person gaining capacity and the supports or assistance which would permit self-management without a representative. So they have to allude to the potential uh, for uh, the person being able to get on, along with his or her own decision making, perhaps with decision making, perhaps with supports. Representatives, uh, you, you will recall, then have to consent. They have to satisfy the court that uh, uh, they are suitable persons, uh, that they'll uh, be governed by the views and wishes of the adult, that the relationship between the adult and the person is suitable, and that the person can actually exercise the authority uh, that would be given to him or her by the court making an order. As I mentioned, you know, there is parsimony here in the way in which the court hands out authority. It's not just do anything you want the way it used to be. Um, the authority granted has to be specified by the court. It has to relate to an incapacity issue uh, where there is a necessity to make decisions. And again, there's this pervasive notion of it having to be the least restrictive and least intrusive form of support. And although the court would be bound to do this anyway, the court is required by statute to consider the fundamental rights, freedoms, dignity, and autonomy of the adult. 
The range of authority, as I mentioned, can still be very broad because we're still talking about taking decision-making authority away from the person. So it can relate to living arrangements, associates, social and recreational activities, employment, education, licensing, litigation. Um, there are some areas where power uh, can only come fr from uh, the court that the guardian or representative does not have the authority to make decisions on family law matters or aversive stimuli or tissue removal or to make gifts um, and it can't be amended except by the court's permission. Adults are required to be informed and involved no matter what the court concludes about uh, uh, their capacity to make uh, decisions. And representatives are required to make the least restrictive decisions that promote self-care. They inform representatives, that, that is, inform the adults who are subjects of impending decisions, encouraging their participation, advising them of options, uh, and any decisions that have already been made. Representatives don't have unfettered freedom to do whatever they want when they are, are given an order by the court. They have to follow the capable instructions of the individual where he or she is still able to do that. They have to act in accordance with the person's wishes in the absence of a capable instruction if it's reasonable according to the legislation. If there are neither instructions nor wishes available for the representative, they have to follow the person's values and beliefs. Um, and if none of the above apply in terms of providing guidance for the representative, they have to promote the well-being, that critical concept I mentioned, and the person's financial interests. The representatives have to keep accounts uh, that ensure that they're being responsible, not wasting the assets, um, and uh, uh, not defying the order of the court and abusing the person's rights. They have to report at the end of any appointment as well. There are the opportunities for reviews of orders uh, that are mandatory as required by the justice's order, where there are significant changes for the adult, uh, where the representative him or herself becomes less able or suitable, uh, and the court may then, as I mentioned, decide to continue an order, to vary it, or to rescind it, you know, depending upon what the circumstances are. And there are opportunities for appeals to the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal uh, to ensure that any legal errors can be scrutinized by a higher court. There are regulations that uh, are an essential part of understanding the whole legal framework um, that are subsidiary forms of legislation outside the statute but empowered by it, uh, designating uh, physicians and psychologists as assessors with other professionals have to, having to have tra training before they can uh, do assessments. Guidelines may be established for conducting assessments. Uh, the regulations also specify there are duties to advise the adult of certain matters within the, the regulations. It talks about persons who may be present during uh, an assessment, including a support person, so the subject is not on his or her own. And it talks about the standard for assessing capacity. Uh, the regulations also uh, specify the contents of representation plans and provide guidance for affidavits. Um, they have a number of other uh, issues uh, that are covered that uh, enable complaints to be made and describe a complaints process and investigation. Uh, so that again, people aren't just left there uh, without there being accountability uh, in terms of these orders. So, I'm at 19 minutes and 15 seconds, I think. <laughs> Excellent, Archie. Well done. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I have provided you with a quick tour of history and the legislation. Um, I have not meant by any means to say that uh, this legislation deserves the utter condemnation that the Incompetent Persons Act did. It doesn't. It is a better piece of legislation. But as you'll hear from my fellow panelists, it's not good enough. And it's not good enough in some very fundamental ways uh, that I still think require our province to catch up uh, with modern values, both modern constitutional values and international human rights law. And that's what you're going to hear about next. Thank you so much. My name is Anna McCory. As Ruth mentioned, I am with Inclusion International, and we are the 
Global Federation of People with Intellectual Disabilities and their families. We have about 200 members in about 115-ish countries around the world. Um, by and large, we are organizations of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. And for more than 50 years, our focus has been around how do we support people to live and be included in their communities. Our history, much like NSACL, is not that different um, than all of our members around the world. It typically starts with families coming together to try and create a better life for their sons and daughters. The issues we tend to come up with almost right away are inclusive education, uh, living and being included in your community, very similar to the, the Emerald Hall case that Archie was referring to, and a really key priority that comes up no matter where we are all of the time is the right to, to make decisions and to have your voices heard. So when Inclusion International began um, being part of the negotiations of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we did a lot of work with our members to find out what mattered most to them. And that was a core issue that had come forward and it's about recognizing that all people have the right to make decisions and have those decisions respected. And that that may require access to supported decision making where assistance in exercising that legal capacity is required. And that we need to establish supported decision making legislation and we need to reform guardianship. And we know that the development of practical conditions are required to make supported decision making successful. And as we've moved from negotiations to implementation, and I think a, a strong case for what we're seeing here in Nova Scotia, is moving forward from, well, what do those big lofty principles actually mean in practice? And what we continue to hear around the world is families, individuals, governments, people struggling with that practical piece, the how-to piece of this. But what we know for sure is that when we don't get it right without a voice, People are powerless, they have no control in their lives, and they have no agency. So why does it matter? I think it's important, I have some pictures that are up here of some colleagues of mine who help me understand this issue every day, who help me understand that this is not some random, far off, really technical piece of legislation. This is people's lives that we're talking about. And as Archie was saying in his piece about sort of what does guardianship law or the new capacity legislation cover, really it can cover who you hang out with, what you do in a day, where you live. These are big things and these are real people that we're talking about. So it matters because we know when people are valued and when people have control in their lives, they are safer in our communities. They are more included in our communities. When people have more control in their lives, they are safer and more respected. So a couple of pictures here in the upper left corner of that is my colleague Kiara. And she got married six years ago. She'll be mad I don't remember the day of that. Um, and she is a woman with an intellectual disability. And they had lots of challenges in being able to understand she wanted to get married. She wanted to have a family. That's a, a key piece of who she is. And these are the types of decisions she has the right to make. My uh, colleague and, and close friend Charlie is one of the greatest teachers I've ever had in my entire life. Charlie has very, had, unfortunately Charlie passed away a number of years ago. He had very, very significant support needs. Charlie did not use words to communicate. He did not communicate in ways that people who didn't know him would understand. It was his family that people and trusted people around him that could help articulate Charlie's will and preferences. And without that, Charlie was extremely vulnerable to people just making decisions for him. A story I share a lot about Charlie is his decision that he was ready to move out. So Charlie's the youngest of three boys. And as families are prone to do, siblings grow up, go to school, move away. So his older brothers grew up, went to school, moved away. And Charlie, who used a wheelchair to get around in his house, started going to the back of their front door and knocking on the door. I wouldn't have known what that meant. Truth be told, it took his parents a little while to figure it out. But they realized that was Charlie's way of saying, it's my turn. I want to get out this door. I'm next. They left. I'm leaving too, kind of thing. And they worked for years to make sure that they found a place that was respectful of what Charlie would want. 
Charlie's mom, who's an amazing advocate, very easily found another family. She knew the mom, they got along well, the kids had similar support needs. You could line up staffing, all of those things. But Sue knew she couldn't do it because the daughter of the other person did not like loud noises. One of my favorite things about Charlie is that guy loved opera more than anything in the world. And he loved opera loud and all the time. And it wouldn't have been the right place. And that would not have been a decision that respected what he wanted. Uh, in this corner here, so the bottom right corner, is a picture from uh, one of our core teams that was involved in negotiating the UN Convention. The woman in the front is from Nicaragua. Her name is Haide. She's talked a lot about, she knows that she needs some help when she goes into a medical appointment. She wants someone who can come in with her and help her understand what's going on, who can maybe explain things in non-medical ways, but she wants that doctor to talk to her and she wants that doctor to listen to her. And those are her decisions. She needs help, she needs support, but it's her choices in her life and she deserves that respect. Also in the other corner is a young woman, a Canadian woman, uh, named Rebecca Biani, who again has very significant support needs, does not communicate traditionally. And Rebecca gave a presentation from the floor of the UN talking about how important it was to have family in her life so she could be included and that her will and preferences were respected. So these are the reasons that it matters. These are about our lives. We recently did a global report called Independent But Not Alone. And it sort of captures, I think, the idea when we talk about decision making and supported decision making, frankly for all of us, none of us make really big decisions in our lives without talking to someone about it whether that's a trusted advisor, whether that's a friend, whether it's a family member, and none of us make any random decision in the world that we wanna make. We are all constrained by our finances, by our practicalities. I would love to up and move to Fiji in the winter because my kids hate snowsuits and that causes me an awful lot of struggle in the morning. I can't do that, right? So we all know that there's realistic constraints on how we make decisions. And I think often in the conversations that we've had when we talk about this, is it gets wrapped up in this idea that people have to do it alone. You've got to be able to make your own decisions on your own two feet, when really none of us are doing that all that often. So what we heard in our global report is from self-advocates, people saying we want to be heard and we want to make decisions about how we live our lives. Pretty simple stuff, right? We heard from families that they need help in supporting their family member to do that. What does it look like? How do I balance out when I'm terrified about what my fears are and what some practical constraints are? And what we heard from organizations is how do we respond to will and preference if we're running a group home or a small options home or helping people live on their own? And how do we as organizations work as agents of change to create inclusive communities? So the key findings that we had, and wow, that's small. If you are across the room, I apologize for that. Um, the key findings that we had is independence isn't alone, and that people are safe when they have relationships. Often we talk about guardianship as it relates to safety, that somehow this piece of legislation is gonna keep people safe. And at the end of the day, we know that's not true. What keeps people safe is keeping them connected to their communities having meaningful relationships where people are gonna be looking out for you. People are gonna say, hey, you know, Julian comes to Tim Hortons every day and he didn't show up today. I wonder what that's all about. I need to keep an eye out for that. I should ask his mom. I should ask someone what's going on here. We know that families have a really critical role to play here. They have a huge role around building those social connections and those relationships. And we know that supported decision making starts early and it starts at home. We cannot expect someone who's never in their entire life had to make any decision of any kind to magically turn into this decision-making adult at the age of 18. We need to be building that self-advocacy understanding from a very young age. We know family-based organizations have a leadership role as agents of change, and that none of this happens in the absence of community inclusion. If kids aren't going to school, if we're not in your beaver's cub, if we're not in your, 
you know, soccer team. We're not seen as valued members. And when we're seen as others, and when we're seen as someone that you can question, it's easier to take away our capacity. It's easier to say, oh my god, they clearly can't make that decision. Instead of understanding how people make decisions. Um, so it also it's more, about more than the removal of guardianship and substitute decision making, and it is about an investment in empowerment. So really quickly, the UN Convention, what does it do? It shifts us from, shifts us from an old model of an ability to understand and appreciate to a new equation where we say ability, by which we mean any way for someone to express their will and preference. And we all know everyone has some way that they can express their will and preference. Plus support and accommodations is what equals legal capacity. That's our new paradigm, that's our new shift. And another important piece as referred to in the general comment is that the CRPD shifts us away from best, or shifts us away from best interest to best interpretation of will and preference, which is a really important shift in there. So what is supported decision making? The first thing to say about supported decision making is that it is massively misunderstood and that many of us are still really struggling to find ways of making that more accessible and better understood. A neat thing about supported decision making is that it is 100% a made in Canada concept. Came out of a, um, an alternatives to guardianship task force from the Canadian Association to Community Living, for Community Living. And when we were negotiating the UN convention, we were able to introduce it as a, a potential alternative to the guardianship laws and, and got everyone on board. And it is now secured in the CRPD that people have the right to use support to make decisions. So what does that mean? Really, it means a whole bunch of different things. Supported decision-making could be as simple as plain language, providing people information and language that they can actually understand and, and process. It is about, could be things like support with planning. So um, Kiara and uh, my colleague Quincy, who had been in the picture in the bottom, they might need help with things like budgeting. They might need help with things like coming up with a grocery plan and, and coming up with a menu plan. Sometimes people might need support with understanding consequences and implications of decisions. So they want to have someone that they can talk to and say, okay, so if I do it this way, this is what's going to happen. If I do it this way, this is what's going to happen. And simply having the opportunity to walk through the outcomes of decisions could be sufficient for someone to, to meet their decision-making needs. We also have, as is the case with Rebecca and Charlie, much more intensive um, supported decision-making efforts. And those are sometimes in Canada referred to as circles of support. And that is where you have a group of people or a circle of support around someone whose job it is to articulate the individual's will and preferences. They are the people who know that individual and they are the people who have that trusted relationship who are able to put words that we understand to the decision that their family member or their trusted friend is trying to make. Quickly, I'm just going to touch on um, the concluding observation. So in the, at the UN level, all countries who have ratified a convention have to report to the relevant treaty body related to that convention. Canada last March, so a year ago, uh, reported to the CRPD, the Committee on the um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And one of the jobs of the committee is to hear from the government, obviously, but also to hear from community. And then what the committee does is step away, do a bit of an analysis, and come up with what we call concluding observations. And those are essentially where the committee gets to say, here's what we kind of think is going on, and here's what we think you need to do. So they have recommendations that come out of there. So a couple I wanted to highlight specific to Canada and Article 12, which is the article in the Convention on Legal Capacity, is that Canada needs to withdraw its declaration and reservation on the convention. Uh, specifically on Article 12.4 of the Convention, carry out a process to bring federal, provincial, and territorial legislation in line with the Convention. Uh, additionally, they need to collaborate with provinces and territories to create a consistent framework for recognizing that legal capacity and remove any exclusionary provisions in federal statutes, so things like Bank Act, Bank Act Income Tax Act, those sorts of things. What's important for me in highlighting these is I think... Um, one of the disappointments in the Nova Scotia legislation, which we will get to <laughs> in more detail, 
is that for me it's also a really lost opportunity. We had the chance to be one of the most progressive provinces in Canada and certainly to become a leading example around the world around what it means to meet the obligations in Article 12. And the legislation falls significantly short of being able to do that. Um, the legislation talks the talk in some regards and in some places. The legislation does not walk the walk. There is very little to back up the, uh, the, the sort of loftier aspirations that have been captured in there. And I think it's important that while um, the convention often is understood as something that Canada ratifies, Canada as the, the ratifier, I suppose that any lawyer here is welcome to correct me on my terminology, um, does have a responsibility to ensure that the convention is implemented throughout the federation. And that requires collaborating with provinces and territories. And it requires looking at, um, at how not just our legal capacity legislation is working, but how, is, how are we establishing a pan-Canadian approach on implementing the convention as a whole. So I added in here some of the concluding observations more broadly around um, requiring that pan-Canadian approach, uh, setting up some mechanisms, ensuring that legislation at provincial and territorial levels, which is to be updated, includes specific measures to implement obligations of the state party under the convention. I think it's pretty clear Nova Scotia has not met most of these standards. Um, so I am going to stop there and hand it over to Sheila. But again, for us, um, for me, it is really about how do we ensure that at the heart of all of this, the lives and stories and real people are what we're focused on. We often tend to legislate to worst case scenario. We tend to panic around worst case scenario. And worst case scenario very rarely is the actual case that we're dealing with. So I think we really just want to make sure we are ensuring we are respecting the will and preference and the rights of people in all things that we do. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much. Um, so perhaps one message of uh, tonight's panel is that Deinstitutionalization isn't just about moving people from big buildings to little buildings. We have to deinstitutionalize our minds. And this means shifting the very old habits of mind that we see inscribed in laws like our old and to some extent our new Adult Guardianship Act. So the question I want to ask is whether the new law helps or hinders that process of deinstitutionalizing our minds. Um, or does it do a little of both? So this is my plan. Um, first, I want to take us back to what Anna has already so beautifully addressed, which is why this matters, this work of revisiting the laws and the practices that we've come to know as guardianship. Um, and in answering that, I'm going to review some of what you've heard about the CRPD and supported decision making. That second, I'll turn to some examples of progress in the new law, which Archie's already given you um, a view of or a preview of, including what I'm going to say are opportunities in the new law for enriching and deepening our practices of supporting and respecting autonomy. Third, I'm going to turn to some major failings of the new law, and then I'll end with some thoughts on opportunities for advocacy in light of this law. So why? This matters, and again, I, I thank Anna for what she brought forward on this question. Um, the laws and the law reform that we're discussing matter because people matter. Um, our families, our friends, we ourselves matter. Uh, and who we are, in great part, is the sum total of our hopes and our dreams and our desires um, and our preferences. We want to be recognized and respected, as Anna um, was saying, so we want our hopes and our desires uh, to be recognized um, and respected. So this is Rusi Stanov. Um, in the year 2000, Rusi was placed under public guardianship in his home country of Bulgaria in proceedings that were initiated by um, his sister who wanted him out of the family home. He had at some point in his life been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Six days um, after a public guardian took his file, Rusi was loaded into an ambulance 
and driven 400 kilometers to a decrepit institution in the mountains. I visited it this summer, actually. It's all shut down and even more decrepit than then. A place for men with psychiatric disorders. He lived there for 10 years in uncrowded and unsanitary, often freezing conditions. He survived in part because he had permission to walk the many kilometers from that place into town to do odd jobs for people. So he'd get himself up in the mornings and out. He'd avoid the obligatory routine sedating drugs that everybody had to take. And despite his formal inability to make contracts under Bulgarian law, he'd trade his labor for a little coffee or some alcohol or some money or some cigarettes. Um, he entered into relationships, into transactions, um, and he kept himself alive in the eyes of others in that community. Sorry, I'm a super emotional person, so you don't have to get alarmed when that happens. It just happens to me all the time. Uh, so he stayed alive where many others around him uh, perished. So one day in 2002, some human rights observers came to that institution and they met Rusi, and he saw his chance. He wanted to fight. Um, he, like Landon Webb here, set out on a long road to try and get out from under guardianship and out of the institution. He tried it domestically, and when he failed in the courts there, he and his legal team went to Strasbourg, to the European Court of Human Rights, and this is him standing there in Strasbourg. Um, Rusi Stana's victory against his country is recorded in a famous 2012 judgment of that court called Stanov in Bulgaria. It was the first time that that court recognized placement in a social care institution, as they call a place like that, um, by a guardian uh, as a deprivation of liberty, recognized it as a deprivation of liberty. And it was the first time they recognized conditions in a social care home, so-called, um, as cruel and un inhuman treatment. So Rusi was my writing partner for a chapter in a book on guardianship. Um, and we started the essay with something he said in one of our conversations. He said, I had plenty of dreams, but then I was put in an institution and I had only one dream, to be free. At his hearing in Strasbourg, he conveyed to the court through his lawyer the words that you see here. I'm a person, not an object. I need my freedom. On this slide as well is a drawing that Rusi made of figures that he would etch along the road. Uh, sorry, it always happens. <sighs> as he'd walk uh, from the institution through the woods um, to the village. So his making that journey day in and day out to join in community with others, um, to be with the free, is to me a sign of the indomitability of the human spirit. So Rusi died last March in Bulgaria. Ah, there you go again. I'm not going to be on video, <laughs> uh, having been turned away from hospital in circumstances that have given rise to a public inquiry. When he died, he was still under guardianship and he was still living in an institution. Now these were better conditions than he'd lived in before, um, but he was still separated from the community in a way that he found profoundly stigmatizing and constraining. His attempt to get out from guardianship had unfolded in a way that was more Kafkaesque than Kafka ever wrote. Um, in our essay, I asked, if this happened to Rusi Stanev, internationally celebrated human rights hero, because he kind of is, he's a little famous in that crowd, um, then what good are human rights? Uh, so that's Bulgaria, and it's far away, but it's so close. And the reason I open with it is because Rusi was my friend. Um, but also because the treatment of persons with disabilities as objects to be handled, placed, treated, fed, uh, tied down, locked down, pushed around, sent to bed, right? Sent away. Sorry. <laughs> be more powerful if I actually say it. It's also down home Nova Scotia. And it's as deeply set in our institutions and our habits of mind as it was in Rusi's home. So, uh, the saga of Rusi Stenov's fight against Bulgaria is a little like the story of Landon Webb, which Archie has um, so nicely relayed. I told Rusi about that case when I first um, met him, and he shot me a big smile. Um, both these men fought with their governments and their laws, and they won in court on grounds that centered on liberty. 
Um, Landon got out from guardianship. Rusi didn't. But in both cases, what followed at the level of law reform was disappointing. In Bulgaria, efforts to enact far-reaching legislation centered on supported decision-making has stalled. But what about Nova Scotia? We now have not an Incompetent Persons Act, but an Adult Capacity and Decision-Making Act. The question is, um, what does that mean for human rights? And again, I'm not going to be just dumping, dumping on this. I want to say there are opportunities and openings here that are really important as well. Um, the SAGA, uh, sorry, uh, Archie and Anne have introduced the UN CRPD and its relevance to the reform of guardianship laws. And more importantly, um, it has relevance to securing the services and supports that make choice and equality possible in more than theory. Um, so the CRPD was an expression, not just not of academic ideas or you know, top-down bureaucrat um, power, but ground-up organizing of disabled persons organizations and their allies from around the world, like Inclusion International, uh, which Anna took part in. There's a number of people from Nova Scotia who took part in this stuff, Steve Esty and others, um, the Canadian Association for Community Living, many others. The result is a legal instrument that connects the human rights of persons with disabilities together in a mutually um, supportive web, let's say, of civil and political, as well as social, cultural, and economic rights. So rights to vote or assemble mean very little on the ground without equal access to education or housing or an adequate income or standard of living. Rights to equality and liberty mean nothing if you can't make your own decisions. So the CRPD brings human rights down to earth or attempts to, to meet the lived realities of persons with disabilities. But realization of this is another matter, as Anna was saying. Um, while CRPD rights are not directly enforceable at home or domestically here in Canada, the fact that we've ratified it should guide interpretation of existing laws and it should also guide law reform. So these, this is a list of guiding principles from the CRPD, nicely summarized by uh, Suzanne Litka, who was Landon Webb's lawyer. She gave a presentation on this act a few weeks ago. Um, again, the point, uh, my listing them here, it's just to note uh, the CRPD's interconnected web of rights, um, which lays the ground or attempts to lay the ground um, for all our you know, diverse human family to have an equal share in what we value and what we value most. So this is Article 12, which Anna was talking about, and it's at the center of the CRPD statements of relevance to guardianship laws. Um, it draws a straight line connecting the right to equality before the law. I'm going to, you know, you may not absorb all of this. It'll be online later. I'll give you the copy if you want to pour over the language. Um, straight line between equality before the law and the duty of states to provide the supports that persons with disabilities may require to exercise their legal capacity. Okay, so that's, you know, the statement that we signed on to. So this has been described as requiring a kind of paradigm shift a radical reorientation in our ways of thinking and acting. Um, it means rethinking old models of guardianship, focused on substituting one person's judgment and will for another's, and replacing those um, with recognition that all decision-making requires support, as Anna was so nicely pointing out. Um, so I try and capture bits of that in this chart. Um, this paradigm shift also requires recognizing that equality means accommodation of disability. And so provision of the supports that are required um, to exercise legal capacity. So that's a lot that I'm sort of rolling in there, but you've heard it a few times in a few different ways and we can talk more about it. So this slide, and again, sorry, it's so packed, but again, you know, you can look through it later if you like. Again, it's shared with me by Suzanne. Um, it provides guidance on some of the forms that supported decision-making may take. And again, I'm building on what Anna's already laid down. Um, the point at the top there is that legal capacity and so decision-making authority is retained by the person. That's kind of the first principle of supported decision-making. And then examples of supports include, um, as Anna was saying, you know, assistance in breaking down uh, a problem, a decision, analyzing it, communicating information, 
and conveying to third parties, I really like this last, the last bullet there, conveying to third parties the individuality and personhood of persons who may otherwise be dismissed on the basis of disability. You know, their will may just be disregarded. The supporter has that role too. Um, supports my, uh, also, I'm going to say, must include um, a range of meaningful options for choice. That's starting to build out a little bit into the social and economic. Um, plus an environment that's conducive to choice. So this might require, for instance, crisis anticipation and intervention for some people. You can't make a decision when you're absolutely in a tizzy. Um, it might require adjusting the sensory environment in the case of some persons on the autism spectrum. Um, it also requires, as Anna brought out, building trust. This is of deep importance to all of us in developing autonomy and in making decisions reflective of our values. Um, and building trust and self-trust, especially when it's been systemically eroded, um, demands very careful, intentional uh, work. Um, I go further to argue supports for legal capacity has to include attention to a range of social determinants. So beyond just targeting assistance when particular decisions are being made. So I've cited some elements of the CRPD that are on point, and that would be a whole other lecture to go through each of them, but I think that's really important to keep that bigger picture or bigger web in mind. Things like housing, things like, you know, food, things like you can't make good decisions when you're starving, you know. Uh, okay, so um, with that, I would just want to ask, in light of the aspirations, I've, I've started to, um, you know, go through, um, what opportunities or openings does the Adult Capacity Act present for realizing what I've described as a paradigm shift? And what kinds of challenges or concerns um, does it raise? So Archie described the framework of principles that are to guide the Act's interpretation and application. They state that a person should not be deemed incapable because their decisions, like he said, are deemed risky or unwise or because they communicate in an unconventional way. Um, orders and decisions are to be least restrictive on liberty. They must promote the person's well-being, which, as Archie noted, is defined to include personal autonomy and social inclusion and participation, you know, as well as promoting their financial interests. So there's a lot rolled into those principles. Um, as you've also seen, the Act defines capacity, legal capacity, as the ability with or without support. Those are sort of the important words, but it's, it's like finding Easter eggs or something. Like there's little droppings of mention of support here and there, and you try and pull it together into something like a whole. So defines capacity as the ability with or without support to understand and appreciate the information relevant to the decision and the foreseeable consequences. So this is the standard legal test in Nova Scotia, understand and appreciate, with the important twist of capacity with supports. The question is, what does that or what should that mean? Another kind of tantalizing gesture to the idea of supporting legal capacity is this statement, um, that capacity assessors must indicate what forms of support or assistance, if any, would enable decision making without appointment of a representative. So the problem, as I'll know further in a moment, is that there's no express duty on anyone in particular to fund or deliver those supports. So further, a last thing on definitions, the word support is defined in the Act to mean supports reasonably and practically available to assist in decision making. And some examples are given in the Act itself. So peer support, communication and interpretive assistance, individual planning, coordination and referral for services and admin assistance. So that's, that's actually capturing p big pieces of what we've been talking about. It's defined. Uh, but again, the question is, who bears the duty to provide these supports? Arguably, assessors bear the duty at the point of assessment. But <laughs> what resources will assessors have for anticipating or supplying them? You know, in addition, courts may ask, applicant representatives whether they've exhausted supports. But this implies that those courts have a robust understanding of when and how supports may serve people in specific contexts. And we have little guidance on that in Nova Scotia. So those are some indications of tentative progress 
toward a kind of you know, ethos of support being inscribed in our new law. This slide, and it's packed with stuff, but it describes a few further ways in which I think some progress is evident in this law. So I've said there's now a duty on assessors to consider how decision-making supports might avert a finding of incapacity. In addition, the law includes some new procedural protections. Capacity assessors must tell the person the purpose of the assessment and its potential consequences. That didn't used to be the case. Uh, and also their right to have a trusted person present. They must be informed of that. Their right to use a communication device. Um, there are also clearer ways for adults to complain about or challenge an order or decision in court. And last, um, representatives, and I want to take just a little a moment with this, representatives have duties that are arguably influenced by a support-based model. So once you're appointed as a representative. Um, these duties are, however, still nested in uh, the bigger model of incapacity. So they include, as Archie said, keeping adults informed about and involved in uh, decisions, respecting their wishes, um, and promoting their independence. So just to look for a moment a little cl more closely at those duties as potential sites of innovation. Um, you know, as, as sort of duties um, around which we might start asking, how can communities and families start building new practices, best practices in this regard? So first, as Ar Archie noted, the Act places a duty on the representative to encourage the adult to become, to the extent possible, capable of self-care and decision-making. So what's the, wh how, what are the best kinds of practices? What are some um, uh, you know, tips or guidelines? We might start to build around that. Second, the rep must encourage and facilitate the adult's participation in decisions, including advising them of the options. This is not about just making decisions for people and not telling them about the options like you would in another case. Um, the rep must follow certain rules, as Archie said, on how to arrive at a decision. So the rep has to decide, as he said, according to the person's prior capable instructions, if there are any on point. And there's a bit more law on how you sort of discern whether they're on point. If there aren't, and this is the point I want to focus on, the rep has to adhere to the adult's current wishes. None of Nova Scotia's other laws on decision-making capacity give current wishes similar weight. There's only uh, one other law I'm aware of that does this in Canada, BC's Representation Agreement Act. So more fully stated, as, as Archie said, the rule is decide in accordance with the current wish unless the representative can establish this would be unreasonable. So we have to sort of pause there for a second. It's arguably a kind of weasel word, right? What's reasonable to you may not be reasonable to me, but a representative would have to be able, if they were challenged in court, to establish that the adult's current wish is so out of line with their financial interests or their well-being, and again, well-being is defined in the Act to include not just health, but autonomy, inclusion, participation, that it can't stand, right? In fact, using the CRPD as an interpretive tool for this word reasonable, you might argue adults have a right to risk. They should have a chance to learn from their mistakes within this reasonableness limit that the, that the Act states. So I'm not saying, hey, this is a great you know, law, but I am saying you can actually work within this in some potentially innovative ways. Uh, I'm going to have to close it down. Um, this is just a little bit more about the representative's duty. A last point I wanted to make uh, is that, um, it's not this one, Archie already talked about this, uh, that the representative is to um, consider whether express wishes, again, on the um, uh, rule that they must decide in accordance, accordance with current wishes, must consider whether express wishes are informed and voluntary. So this obliges the representative to ask, not only does the person have enough information to inform their wish, but are they perhaps bending to someone's pressure to take that into account, to take power relationships into account? Um, so those are some aspects of the um, representative's duties that I wanted to mention. And as I just wrap up, 
Some of the key concerns we might think about as we talk about the act um, are these. I've said that there are these Easter egg sort of, you know, nuggets of support for supports in this act. But at the same time, um, these gestures are partial. So concerns about the act include, one, you know, it's continuing emphasis on removing capacity, despite these asides about supports. Two, the fact that the act doesn't vest anyone, and in particular the state, with a duty to provide those supports required to exercise legal capacity. And third, an extension of that, I'd say the act should, but it doesn't, set up a center or a clearinghouse or you know, decision support office to engage in research and dissemination of best practices on supporting legal capacity. Um, and last, there's no proactive monitoring or rights advice the way there would be, for instance, if one were in psych hospital. You might balk at the comparison, um, but your basic liberties are potentially suspended in a comparable way. Okay, so I had a couple other concerns. I'm going to just flip through and go to my conclusion. Um, and the conclusion is just about advocacy in light of this act that we have. So my first suggestion uh, involves giving content to the duties placed on representatives, again, to promote independence, to inform adults and facilitate their participation in decision making, and to respect their preferences. I don't think this is just a new way of stating what everybody already does. I'm just going to throw that out there. I think it's an opportunity to culturally, not just in terms of, oh, these are the words that the law lawyers wrote, but to culturally start to reframe decision making of and with persons with significant impairments. So to reframe it as not based in others' assessments of their best interests, treating them as objects, <laughs> Uh, but in their own attention to and respect for their own informed voluntary, as this act puts it, wishes. So I think that's kind of a big deal. And otherwise, I'd say we have an opportunity for advocacy around law reform. Um, so it's going to say a little bit more about, you know, paying more attention to best practices in supported decision making. But my very last slide. Um, goes to law reform, and this includes participation in, as Anna was saying, federal, provincial, territorial processes under the CRPD for revisiting legislation together, um, but also um, our own act, this is kind of one of the final uh, words of the new act, states that within three years after it comes into force, there will be a review of its effectiveness, um, including consideration of supported decision making. So that's an invitation. Um, for more advocacy and more concerted strategic thought around this. Thanks for that. Thank Thanks, everybody. So we wanted to open the floor, provide an opportunity to engage in a little bit more conversation with people. So are there any questions from the floor? From any other panelists? Alice. Alice. I've got a question. So a parent um, was telling me that her son, who was no longer able to live at home, was living in a group home, and the group home was sedating him and giving him medication without her no knowledge, without anyone, any advocates knowing about that. And so she applied for a guardianship order so that she could insist that she had the information about his sedation and how he was medicated and had some input into that. And I wonder how that would now um, work. <laughs> and what next steps would be in that situation, given that she couldn't take him out of the home given her circumstances that she couldn't then live with her and she didn't have an alternative housing option. Who? Would you like to respond, Anna? Do you want to? I have questions about that rather than that. Because I have questions about what... I've been dealing with this in a couple situations. I feel ignorant about it. So I'm going to see if my colleagues here have answers or others do. Are the, mics, have, are the mics on? Sorry. I would have thought, sorry, that ordinarily um, the mom would be a substitute decision maker, so she'd always have to be kept informed and she'd be part of that. But. But I'm treating it like I treat hospital, where that's just the case, right? Your son's in hospital, you're the substitute. Is there something, this is my question, is there something that happens, oh, no, no, but he, okay. Yes, 
He's an adult. Oh, hold on. So I'm missing this. I missed that part. So, so, he's so an adult. Oh, I missed that. Okay. Living in a group home. Yes. So he doesn't own. So, so they have, hold on. So the group home's understanding is that he's consenting to this. Or I, I don't understand. Yeah, they're giving him. The parent didn't understand, though, that it was happening. Alice, is that it? She thought that they were over-medicating him in order to stop him having any behaviours that they found difficult, okay. instead of looking at what was causing the behaviours and the situation of things, and without knowing when he was being sedated and what medications he was being given, she wasn't able to um, support him to make, you know, the right decisions. You know, and, and the only way to get the power to say something was to have that guardianship act. So, uh, I'm thinking if there were such a thing as a, as a supported decision making act, she might have entered into an agreement with him such that she was his supporter without having done that work you have to do even under this act, she you know, would be applying to be the representative, which is akin to the guardian, who then would have those decision making powers if the judge determined that her son was incapable of making those decisions, right? Okay. So, around medication only. Yes, around medication or whatever she was applying for guardianship in relation to. But the home can't just medicate people you know, to restrain them. That's you know, prior the, question. They, they are only allowed to provide medication with the consent of the individual or a substitute uh, decision maker or a representative under this new legislation they have no legal right whatsoever just to medicate, to subdue, and to control, mm -hmm. except in the instance of imminent harm to the person or somebody else, but not for other reasons. So one is deeply concerned in all total institutions about the risks of uh, chemical restraint, both in terms of the hazards that they may cause, the damage to the person's uh, autonomy and integrity, um, and the violation of their rights. Um, and so, um, you know, one should be deeply concerned about any facility, whether it be a psychiatric facility, whether it be a, a home for special care, uh, or some other small options if medications are being misused as a matter of convenience or because of resource constraints. So I, I think it's a fundamental legal principle uh, that uh, you, know, you just have to insist upon the home being aware of and, and not abusing uh, medication for simple purposes of control. The only piece that I would add to what Archie just said is often guardianship becomes the lesser of two evils in, for many families who are struggling with issues exactly like you've mentioned. There are similar challenges families have in a lot of countries, I, I have to confess I'm not sure the status here in Nova Scotia, where laws prohibit people from inheriting money, from owning property. And so a family that's trying to secure their son or daughter's financial future goes after guardianship simply to preserve some financial security for them. So there are some really significant drivers to guardianship that need to be addressed. And it's sort of mm -hmm. some of the points that Sheila was raising earlier about how it is we get to this point is just as important as the point that we're at. Like really looking at what's going on in a person's life. But to, to Archie's point, that there's a fundamental court challenge or challenge of some kind to be made. They have no right to be doing that without the proper legal authority and, and we would assume that the legal authorities would also realize they have no right to be doing that in the absence of imminent harm, blah, blah, blah. If you fear that is happening, that is something that you can take to court. Yeah. Yes. Well, there is also a statute in Nova Scotia called the Protection of Persons in Care Act, uh, which enables anyone uh, and obliges health care and social service providers uh, to complain to the minister if you believe that residents of facilities are being uh, abused or, or, or neglected, you know, so that it is possible to make a complaint under that legislation in situations where you believe the institution norm has become one of abuse or neglect. Great question. 
Yes. And uh, given that there are some other jurisdictions in Canada that do have laws dealing specifically with supportive decision making, are there any of those that you would identify as being uh, more progressive or something that we should should have tried to adopt here? Do you want to start with that? So do you, or do you, sure. Archie? No, go ahead. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are examples across the country. BC is probably one of the more famous ones with their uh, representation agreements. The rep agreement, certainly when we were negotiating the convention, was our like go-to gold standard. The rep agreements are like 30 years old now. So I think there are some things we can look to, and there's little pieces. Ontario's legislation also has fallen quite short. There's little pieces throughout that are building, but there's nothing that stacked it in the, the most effective standardized kind of way. Currently there's reform that's going on in Newfoundland that we hope is, is going to be guided to really pull all of this together. And I think for me that's one of the frustrations with the Nova Scotia situation is that we had that chance to really knock it out of the park and do something innovative, progressive, and, and despite pulling in, you, and you can see the BC rep language throughout a lot of our, the, the new legislation, but it, it just didn't sort of pull enough um, promising practice, I think, to, to really make it go forward. However, none of that exists in one neat package anywhere. And I'd like to draw attention to Sheila's slides, you know, where she, she said uh, that the, our legislation, unfortunately, uh, and I don't think the other provinces either, make it clear that the state has the duty to provide yeah. supports for people who cannot do it themselves, and also to ensure there's a coordination uh, via a resource center or otherwise to ensure that people are, are supported. So it's not just, you know, obviously wealthy individuals, but, but that indigent persons, you know, have the uh, assurance that the state will enable them to exercise their legal capacity, which is what's required by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That's the deepest disappointment about the Nova Scotia uh, variant of uh, um, representation legislation now, that for reasons that elude me, the government was unwilling to take responsibility to protect you know, the international human rights and the constitutional rights of people with disabilities by ensuring that they had supported decision making. I didn't understand it simply because I thought it's not only a matter of protecting fundamental human rights, I would have thought that the government would think that this is excellent politics as well, you yeah. know, to be seen as supporting persons who are otherwise marginalized and disempowered. Uh, and unfortunately, I was in the House, you know, when, and Ruth was as well, uh, on the evening, you know, when the uh, uh, Premier arose to stop consideration of this bill before it went to third reading. And we thought at the time, we, we were, were so, so naive, uh, we thought at the time, oh, you know, they're going to come around, you know, to introduce uh, the kinds of supports that, you know, we have been hoping for and arguing for tonight. But it wasn't that at all. No. Yeah, I've got a couple responses to that as well. And one partly to, to um, uh, Alice's question and building off what, what Archie just said. One of the problems I think that one encounters, whether in the, the sort of the zone of institutionalization or guardianship, is the paucity of options, of meaningful options. And so even in that case in the group home, I mean, we can tell you, we can get on our high white sort of charger and say, you know, that's against the law and you should take them to court. Well, if they're saying, we're going to kick Johnny out of the group home, which is what I hear from people who are having trouble like that, you know, like somebody had some medic real problems, and then the, the response is, well, if you don't like it, lump it. We've got somebody in line who's really happy to take that bed. That is hard, and that's where it comes back sort of to systemic, to to coming together, because <laughs> if there was, you know, a mass complaint, if there, you know, these these are systemic problems over medication, for instance. And then onto the the other models of supported decision making. One that comes to mind, um, and it gets used at just like VCs, but in the context where there aren't family around um, for a person, is this PO skein, the the personal ombuds from you know this little zone in Sweden where they set up. Uh, a system where you have somebody like, maybe it's something like, you know, I think of them as a high power OT, and they're assigned to you, and they're your navig system navigator and friend. <laughs> and, um, 
And some people look at that and think, that must cost so much money. I mean, how can you, it's like setting up a buddy who's there not to control you. It's not like um, assertive treatment, community treatment. It's someone there to facilitate. Um, and talking to the fellow who set that up, Math Jesperson, he says, no, we have done studies on that. We've done the ec economic sort of, you know, uh, uh, analysis of the savings that you make in the jail system and other systems. So I think that's an awesome model, and I'd love for Nova Scotia to pilot it, because we're so small. I feel like we should be using that to launch innovative pilots. Mm -hmm. BC's Representation Act, the only thing um, that I'd say about that, well, two, one is that this, there's an, there is a model in that act, which I think a lot of folks were interested in putting into our act, which was supported decision-making agreements. So these are mechanisms where you come together with the person who, uh, you know, wants support, who you've agreed, yes, is some kind of, you know, we'll work out this supportive relationship through an agreement, but you don't have to put that person through a capa an ordinary capacity assessment of understanding and appreciating the, mat the matters that are going to be under decision. Under BC's Act, it's a different kind of threshold for entering into a supported decision-making agreement that includes having a relationship of trust. Having so it's kind of innovative in that way. It worries a lot of people for that reason, to be honest. Mm -hmm. There's fights about it. And yet, um, the folks who are participating in it, as I understand it, are very um, behind it. So, lots of time. And I would just add, there are a lot of international examples. Like, it, you know, we're seeing progressive legislation coming out in Costa Rica. We're seeing really good examples coming forward in Colombia, Ireland. There are some, some challenges, but uh, there, there is progressive legislation that directly includes that um, some sort of service uh, clearinghouse kind of mechanism. So there are, I mean, there are tons of pieces that are out there that are showing that everyone is moving this forward in very progressive ways, but at the same time somewhat incrementally. Any last questions? Yes, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, that it has to be a, a medical person, or it should be a medical person making the assessment on whether uh, a person has mental capacity for financial or social or work or something like that. But you also mentioned that there's other professionals and that they would have to take some sort of training in. Uh, I know this is new. It is new. So yeah. has anybody done that yet or is anybody... The legislation that? currently uh, empowers only medical practitioners and registered psychologists. That's under the regulations section 4. Um, other health professionals will be able to do assessments, but only once they complete the training program, and I don't believe the training program has been rolled out yet, but that yeah. will include registered nurses or nurse practitioners, social workers, social workers occupational therapists, and licensed practicing member of any other health profession that has designated by the minister. So that could include uh, additional um, health professionals or social service professionals. But, so it's only doctors and psychologists who are currently able to do this without engaging in training. And it was a piece that we really pushed for in the consultation piece because we also, f I mean, some people don't have doctors, for example, and doctors have very heavy caseloads, et cetera. So we really pushed. And that was one piece. I think Anna was there that day. And because also, how are we ensuring that doctors have a current understanding yeah. of this paradigm shift? How are we supporting yeah. new professionals yeah. and, and other communities? Anyone who's a parent who is involved in like the DTC, I basically sit down with my doctor, come up with whatever jargon I know is going to get us what we want, and it's yeah. done. So how are we making sure that systems are done very differently with such significant consequence on the line. No, I, I disagreed with the government and, and spoke about it at the time in these consultations. I thought that no health profession uh, should uh, um, be able uh, to be trusted with the responsibility of uh, doing n assessments under this new legislation without training. I just thought that's part of advancing one's professional competence. And if you're a doctor or a psychologist, one ought to welcome that opportunity. So I thought everyone should be required to take uh, the, the training program. But we don't have an idea of what that training Well, I don't know. I'm not, yeah. I'm not involved with government. I know it's happening. It's being devised, but I don't know I how far it's going. I think, again, I'm going to follow up on that, um, just because um, this is my son, and we're kind of 
involved in all of this right now. And one of the comments I just spoke with one of the physicians who had done um, the assessment for before it changed. Um, and she said they've been pushing for it since October to find out who was able to do it because she wants the training as well. So she was able to do the assessment under the old very ancient act, however, not able to do it now because she doesn't feel like she's trained. Um, and even I'm, I'm a registered nurse and reading through it, I don't even understand a lot of it. And I do physical assessments and different things like that, but just even the wording I'm reading this assessment is a little complicated. Um, so as far as training, even the physicians that were you know doing it beforehand, um, this is with the Dalhousie Medical uh, Development, uh, I'm sorry, Clinic um, Development Adult, uh, adults, um, they don't even know when it's coming, and they've been pushing since October because they wanted to get the training done and in place before it changed, and it changed, and they're still waiting. So that was one of the questions she actually asked us to ask, was if anybody knew when this training was coming. And the last I checked, the, or I made a phone call actually, it, it's in process. They're still hiring staff to get some things rolling, but it's not online yet. Are there any other questions? It's just about um, oh, I'm sorry, well, sir. Uh, in bringing a bigger economy and decision making, are there any safeguards in place to protect individuals from those who would intentionally target them and take advantage of them? Well, I mean, the big safeguard under this legislation is the judge of the Supreme Court who has the responsibility of, of ensuring that the representation plans and the monitoring thereof are in accord with the legislation. So, so but that's where cases come before uh, in courts. Obviously, there are many vulnerable people and people who will not be affected by this legislation who can be the subject of, of predators. We see that all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there are existing, like if you're talking as well about, you know, one of the, the issues we hear a lot is contracts. And so getting a cell phone and then the cell phone bill is like eight bazillion dollars and mom or dad has to pay the cell phone bill. Oh, I see a lot of heads nodding on that one. So there are <laughs> consumer protection legislation that you can go against Bell, you can go against Rogers. And I think sometimes we miss the opportunities within existing consumer protections or existing vulnerable persons legislation pieces that we can use equally as effectively because it is it tends to be those exact little pieces that lead us to the big ones. Um, so how are we making those initial complaints mechanisms more accessible, more disability aware, those sorts of things? Great. Yes, I think we're winding down. So thanks everybody for coming out. I think uh, just finally I'd say that encourage everybody to continue the conversation, get engaged, go to the public trustees website, there's information there, ask questions, be in touch with us or others on the panel because we want to keep the education and dialogue going and it's really a joint effort between people with intellectual disabilities, the community, government, all of us, I think the onus is on all of us to work together to continue to work forward. We have three years, then there's a year of review after that. I don't know if you remember that part. But anyway, we have time to keep educating ourselves so that when we get to that point, we can challenge and offer other options. Thanks everybody for coming out.